Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Majid Azari. I am from the School of Public Health and, and, and from, uh, I guess, actually an affiliate of the Institute and director of the, the Center for Global Health Research, the Welcome Trust Center for Global Health Research. Um, I also happen to, together with Peter Bernie, to have sort of co-organized and, and co-host uh, on behalf of the Institute um, these events, uh, formerly known as the Non-Communicable Disease uh, research forums, now global health forums, more broad, broader than, uh, than, uh, than uh, NCDs. Um, so um, today's topic is actually quite an interesting one. I mean, one that, that truly sort of has, has the whole, uh, I think, meaning of global health in it, which is alternative smoking materials. Uh, they are everywhere, um, they vary, and, and, and by everywhere it means not just in low-income countries, low-income countries and here. Um, uh, just a few sort of basic announcements before we get to today's session. Uh, so, so, so thank you for attending and welcome. Um, the forums take place every month, uh, generally on the third uh, Thursday of each month, although there will not be one next month. Is that the case, Nicolas? I think it will be on a Friday in, in May because of a, uh, of a clash with another event. Um, I am told to those who, who know what hashtag say, to those who know what hashtags are, that, that the event will be live tweeted, and the hashtag is imperial underscore, uh, at imperial underscore uh, IGHI, and, um, and it is going to be recorded, the event. Um, so with those basic announcements, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Bernie, who again really envisioned these fora uh, and, and started them. Uh, Peter will talk about how much of uh, chronic airflow obstruction is really due to smoke. Thanks, Majid. So, I have to wear this. I can leave it on. Good. Okay. Right. So, this is really just by way of an introduction to the to the session. The important bits are going to come a bit later, um, but it's an important question: uh, chronic obstructive lung disease, in some form or another, is one of the most common causes of. Uh, mortality and of disability in the world um, and of course we're used to thinking of it as being essentially a smoking disease um, and that's been questioned a little bit uh, more recently uh, and people have wondered whether that's really quite the case and one of one of the things that people have looked at in cohort studies is to try and estimate uh, how much of the disease is actually associated with smoking and this is from uh, now quite an old uh, summary paper that was put together by the ATS and the ERS, that's the American and the European uh, chest physicians. Um, and what you can see rather surprisingly is that there's a huge variation in the amount that people think of COPD that is actually attributable to smoking. And actually it seems rather a low amount. So 48% a couple that get up to three quarters, but most of it half, even less than a half. If you look at mortality data from the US, you get a much higher figure. So it's generally in the 80s. And if you looked at data from hospitals, you'd find that hospitalization, about 80% would be attributable, of, of COPD would be attributable to smoking. So that seems rather higher. And the question is, uh, can we look a little bit further uh, afield? Now, one of the things that's given this whole story a bit of a boost is some rather strange findings that we find with um, mortality. And I've got some rather distorted maps, but th this is a map of chronic airway obstruction deaths in women under the age of 60. And what it shows is that the highest rates are in here in South Asia and Southeast Asia and here in Sub-Saharan Africa. And that seems very odd for a disease that is primarily a disease that's associated with smoking. If you look at this map, this shows the prevalence of cigarette smoking in women. And you can see that these areas that I've just pointed out tend to be areas of very light smoking. Whereas places like Russia, where you have a lot of smoking, are really not very high places of very high mortality from COAD. And one of the ideas that was put about to explain this was that maybe the, it's the 
indoor air pollution in these parts of the world that might be causing the problem rather than uh, a problem with smoking. So that's given the whole story a bit of a boost. I'm going to talk a little bit about the bold study. Uh, this is a large uh, cross-sectional study at the moment, which is looking at, in quite some detail, at the distribution of chronic obstructive lung disease measured using spirometry in a large number of places around the world, both in the West and in low-income countries. Um, and the information is collected along with information about, amongst other things, smoking, uh, and in fact, uh, use of indoor uh, air pollutants. Um, so what does these data show us about the um, attributable fraction? So just to explain, first of all, if you want to know how much, what proportion of a disease is caused by a subject, we can find it out from this formula. And the reason I put up the formula is not to teach you about the formula, but just to point out to you that you really only need to know two things. One is the exposure to the risk factor, in this case, cigarette smoking. And you need to know the relative risk of cigarette smoking uh, of for um, the disease that you're looking at, so COPD. So this is how many more times likely you are to have chronic obstructive lung disease if you're a smoker. With those two bits of information, uh, you can work out the attributable fraction, which is the proportion of the disease that's caused by smoking. So if we look for at the odds ratios, uh, which are a measure of the relative risk, what we find is that across all the centers of the uh, bold project, what we find is that we get a very, very similar result wherever we look. This is for both uh, sectors together. And you can see that the odds ratio is 2.19. So you're just about twice as likely, if you've ever smoked, you're more or less twice as likely to have COAD than if you didn't smoke. And this measure here, the I squared, is a measure of how different these results are from each other. You can see they're not different from each other at all. So we can say very consistently that wherever you measure it, whether in low-income, high-income countries, the association is more or less the same. And if you look at men and women, uh, this is men, they have uh, just over twofold. In fact, I think these are the wrong way around, but you can see that they are a little bit different from the women. Uh, this, I think, is the men, and the other one was the women, so the men have a slightly smaller uh, relative risk uh, compared with the men. But otherwise, again, the heterogeneity <coughs> is virtually zero. In other words, wherever you measure it, the risk is pretty much the same. So where does that get us when we multiply that by the exposure? And the answer is that it gives us, slightly surprisingly maybe, um, an answer rather similar to the ones that I was showing you before. Here in Ife in Nigeria, in Pune in India, in Blantyre in Malawi, very little um, uh, because there's virtually no smoking in these populations. As the smoking increases, and that's really the only thing that's affecting this difference in smoking rates, you see an increase in the attributable fraction. But that's not changed because the odds ratio is changing. It's changing because the exposure to smoking is changing. That's the only thing that's changing. But what you can see is that even in these places where people really go to town on the cigarettes, it's only about 50% according to what we're showing here. And this is um, a place in the Cape Flats um, where people smoke very heavily indeed. Um, so that's a bit surprising in a way. You'd think that there would be a much higher attributable fraction there. But the explanation uh, is in partly in this in this slide here. So what I've shown here is this is in, in absolute terms. These aren't relative to anything. It's the prevalence of chronic airway obstruction, which is in non-smokers in the white bars and in 
and we're that far from the smokers. And you can see that both are increasing as we get into the places that smoke more. Now, there is a problem with this, and the problem arises because of the way that we define chronic airway obstruction. The chronic airway obstruction is measured by blowing into a machine and seeing, first of all, how much air you can blow out in the first second from a very full lung, compared with how much air you can blow out from your lung altogether. And the ratio of those two things is the, a, a measure of obstruction. Now, how do you know whether someone's obstructed or not? I've given you something which is a continuous measurement. How do you know where to draw the line? Well, the way you draw the line is that you measure a whole lot of people who have no symptoms of lung disease, don't have a diagnosis of lung disease. You measure the distribution of their lung function, and you say, arbitrarily, the bottom 5% of those normal people are actually abnormal. So you define the abnormal as the lower limit of normal, that's what it's called, and it's the bottom 5%. So if you think about it, 5% of all these people, you would think, if they're the same as the people where you've done that measurement, which happens to be in the United States in this case, um, you'd expect 5% of them would be normal anyway. So if we go on to the next phase, you can see that actually this would mean that all these people are really normal, and you should only be looking above the line. Well, this is also a little bit anomalous, because until you get up to here, actually, it's a whole lot of below the line. You've got even the fact that there are smokers and non-smokers here. Um, you're, you're still, you've got less disease there than you would expect. But what you're looking at, if you wanted to know how much of this is actually due to smoking, what proportion, actually, you might look at this proportion here. It would be just as fair as to look at this proportion here. So in a sense, the attributable fraction is a little, when you're using this kind of a measurement, is a bit um, misleading. And you can look in a different way. This is the prevalence of chronic airway obstruction in non-smokers. And you would expect, from what I've told you, that the prevalence if the population was completely normal, would be at about 5%. And I've put here in blue the ones that are actually significantly below that, even uh, for, for reasons we don't know. So there's obviously something protective here or something that in the original sample that we took to estimate what was normal was abnormal after all. And up here, the ones that are marked in red are the ones that are significantly above uh, what you would expect. So we would expect, as we know from other studies, that there are other factors that can cause you chronic airflow obstruction. Uh, but it's not a huge amount. Um, now, there's something else that we can measure, which is a little bit more straightforward. And interestingly, it doesn't have the problem that the attributable fraction has. And that is you can look at the attributable uh, risk, not the attributable fraction. And that's simply the risk in the population as a whole minus the risk in the unexposed. And if we start looking at that, we get something that isn't biased by the way that we've measured or defined the relative risk. And what we find is something that looks a little bit like this. So this now is the overall prevalence of disease in the population that is due to smoking. So if you look across to South Africa, these are all over the age of 40, um, and you find, and it's everybody over the age of 40, so you can see over 12% of this population uh, in South Africa uh, has got chronic airflow obstruction, as I've defined it. Um, and that's due to smoking. So that's really a very, that's a, that, that's a heavy uh, toll on the, on the health of that population. So that's of the whole population, it's not just of the smokers, it's of the whole population. And you can see that down here where they don't smoke at all, clearly that's going to be a very small number indeed. So overall, if you look at 
the prevalence of smoking and the prevalence of chronic air flow obstruction, you can see that there's a lot of scatter about this, and that you'd expect. Oops, there are some trees coming in. Um, but actually, just looking, as we would say, ecologically at the data, you would expect these, each of these dots is a center in the bold study, and you would say that about half the variation that you've got in the airflow obstruction is due to differences in the prevalence of ever smoking. So I'm going to stop there, uh, and we'll go on to the other studies, which will be talking more about other alternative ways of smoking, smoking materials. You can. <laughs> um, I'm actually surprised how consistent your relative risk of cigarette fell sites, given that almost inevitably the number of cigarettes that people smoke are quite mm. different. I mean, you know, cigarettes in, in I mean, people who smoke in Africa mm. probably smoke sort of a third or a quarter of cigarettes uh, per day mm. than those in Eastern Europe. So, so, yeah. so I, I mean, um, what's the sort of story there? I, mean, so, so I would have actually expected more heterogeneity sort of account for, um, you know, not just smoking, but... Yeah, the way that people smoke. I, I think that's a good point, and also what they're smoking is different. Uh, uh, so that's a good point. I think maybe part of it is because the bar for smoking is set very low. So these are people who have ever smoked, and, that may, and also these, this is everybody over the age of 40. So... In a sense, I think that probably evens things out a bit. The populations, um, uh, you know, actually, some of that would go in the, the other direction, and that uh, the you you don't really see very much of an effect in spirometry before the age of forty. People have to have been smoking more or less, I think, for about twenty years before you really see the measures that we're using in spirometry changing. So this is quite a dilute effect, and, and the odds ratio is actually quite low. I mean, I think some people would think that's rather surprising that, that it's as low as that. So it may be something to do with that. Um, yeah. The next speaker is, uh, is Neil Hopkinson, who is a reader in respiratory medicine. I guess he'll talk about e-cigarettes. Thanks very much for the invitation. Um, you know, th there's a, it, it's a big topic, and a topic that generates quite a lot of uh, heat uh, and, and debate. It's uh, unlike most things in public health, where everyone, broadly speaking, will agree that these are potentially bad. Uh, this is this is one that does generate quite a lot of uh, of, of dispute and, and some, sometimes quite uh, angry uh, exchanges between public health people. So. Um, I, I hope I can offer a, a, a reasonable uh, approach based on, on things that we actually know to be true and uh, to address some of the, the possibility and some of the sort of explanatory uncertainty. So uh, I'm going to talk just very briefly about what uh, what, what e cigarettes are, um, who, who, who actually use them, why they use them, what we know about the, the risk of them relative to, to, to smoking, um, touch a little bit on some of the regulatory issues and uh, talk a little bit about some of the unintended consequences that, that, that people worry about. Um, and uh, there'll probably be some time and discussion afterwards to go through some of those uh, uh, as well. So the, the, um, the sort of fundamental idea from this is that people smoke because they're addicted to nicotine. Um, and the, the tobacco industry knows this and very consistently is denying it as recently as the 1980s. Um, but they, they die from the tar. It isn't the nicotine that's killing people, it's the delivery system. It's the, all the other chemicals that are present in, in, in cigarette smoke. Um, so w one alternative is to, is to, to use the devices that deliver nicotine um, in, in, 
way that Elon Musk uh, is, is portrayed in that way, where the cops are used uh, as an accompaniment. Um, and of course, these things already exist as forms of mystery and psychotherapy, which are pharmaceutical, uh, 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 pharma pharmaceuticals, which you can um, put in a prescription or from a, from a chemist over the counter. So there are a range of devices. This is the sort of most basic thing, uh, a sort of CD light device, which has um, a, a cartridge containing the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the liquid that is vaporized, um, and, and an atomizer, and, uh, and a battery. Um, the, the, the material itself is, a, is, is either propylene glycol or, or vegetal glycerin. It's sort of uh, uh, it's a, it's a sort of um, basic uh, vapor material. It contains uh, nicotine usually, though not always, as well as uh, flavorings and, and additives. Um, the sort of second generation of, of, of e-cigarettes are all uh, more like sort of pens. They're, they're, they're bigger. They have bigger tanks. They deliver bit bigger, um, uh, bit bigger uh, doses. Um, and more recently, the third generation devices, the tank devices, um, uh, enable the user to, um, to, to, to introduce um, uh, modified liquids. They can make up their own liquid. They can modify the, uh, the, the temperature at which the vapor is produced, which uh, influences obviously the composition of the vapor and its um, what it feels like to, to, to breathe in. So there's a huge proliferation, and many, many more than would fit on this, this, this table. But you can see that there are both a range of different devices, um, but also uh, uh, range of flavors. There are thousands of different flavors that are available to, uh, to, to buy. And these are um, um, flavorings that, that we know to be safe as, uh, as, 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 as food flavorings. They're safe to eat, um, but obviously one of the concerns is what happens to these when they're, when they're vaporized and, and, and inhaled. Um, so uh, e-cigarettes didn't, didn't used to be a thing. There was a, back, back in, in 2012 when we were welcoming the, uh, the Olympics in London, they, they, were, they were hardly used. Now, last year when we decided to leave Europe, 2.8 million people are, not, uh, are, are using e-cigarettes. Not, I think, a, a causal relationship there. <laughs> um, 1.3 million of the people who are, uh, who, who are uh, vaping are no longer smoking. They're ex-smokers. Uh, about 1.4 million people are, are dual users. So um, I think the bulk of the, the people who are using e-cigarettes as their, as their sort of intermediate And going along with that, an increasing proportion of people who uh, who, who are vapers are, are, are ex-smokers, as, as, as time goes by, and more people are established as, as vapers who used to smoke rather than dual users. Um, these data all come from uh, YouGov, uh, uh, the survey data that uh, actual <coughs> smoking health has, has been doing annually for ten years. Um, so that's the if you like the that that's the epidemiology of it. Do do we have other evidence that? are a way to help people that, that are smoking. Um, certainly people that use them think they are. Um, so this survey looking at people who had been smokers in the previous year and had made at least one attempt to quit, based on self-report, 20% um, of people that had tried to use an e-cigarette had been successful um, versus 10% uh, of people that had just gotten not been taken quite as ill to account in, in the pharmacy, and 15% of people who just decided to give up without any support. Um, so can't go too far with this to, to sort of say so clearly it, it's suggesting that using NRTX you're much less likely to quit than just giving up um, so you know, it's, it's unfortunate to try it um, there aren't very many trials using e-cigarettes and this is partly because um, the, 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 the way in which they've developed has been as consumer devices rather than as, um, as devices which are being developed and marketed with medical claims. So asserting that a device will help a person to stop smoking is a medical claim. Um, so in order to make that, you have to have medical level evidence um, from, from trials, um, whereas simply producing this device as a consumer device and uh, allowing people to use it as, as they wish, of course, you need to use it as they use it to stop smoking, doesn't require, doesn't place the same burden on the, on the manufacturers, though it does limit what, the way that they can market medical. So this is uh, this is uh, you know, pr pr probably the, the, the best study so far, and I, and I think it's fair to say that it isn't a brilliant one. Um, it's these sort of people who uh, were smokers, adults. They wanted to quit. They randomised to either a, a, a nicotine e-cigarette, uh, an e-cigarette with, without um, nicotine and vapour, uh, or, or patches. Um, they were then given to twelve weeks, and then they were followed up. And uh, over the course of a 
year by Science by 300 days with no difference in the hit rates between the groups. But you can see certainly early on in the in the East between the Phoenix and Gillette group appear to, to be more successfully fitting than the, uh, the other two groups. Um, now, what one can take hold of this, uh, the, 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 the way that the mission replacement therapy was administered was not likely to be as effective as possible. And like many studies, it's something new. The, the, the standard of care that was presented as standard of care appears to be nothing like what the actual standard of care would, would, would be, and it would be slightly flawed comparison. But it, it, in a way, it would be extraordinary if a nicotine replacement a device delivering nicotine didn't help people to quit smoking because that's axiomatic of all the other kinds of nicotine replacement therapies that are available, whether they're patches or, or gum or inhalators or, or lozenges. The basic model is that if you can deliver nicotine, if a device can deliver nicotine, you don't have to prove that it affects a smoke cessation if it effectively delivers nicotine because that patient will be improved and never ever, if you replace the nicotine, it helps people to quit. Um, uh, the, the only other trial that actually makes it into the Cochrane uh, re re review, so this is not things that are meth methodologically acceptable, was, it was another study giving uh, these were actually people who didn't intend to quit smoking, um, and which just demonstrates that if you give people an, an e-cigarette with a high dose or low dose of nicotine, or in fact a placebo, it helps them to reduce the number of cigarettes they smoke. So this is mean cigarettes today, there, there are 20 cigarettes per day to start. After a, a couple of weeks of, of using an e-cigarette, those have come down. The, the people with the um, the, the, the placebo was the least effective uh, at, at cutting down uh, smoking rates. So, you know, there's, ev there's this sort of trial evidence that e-cigarettes can be used to, uh, to, to cut down or to, to support quitting smoking. But the, 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 the huge weight of epidemiology, the fact that there are these millions of, uh, you know, 1.3 million cases who are ever smokers, I think is, is probably more compelling. So, uh, as I said, at the start, people smoke because of nicotine, they, 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 they die from the car, and the idea of harm reduction is, uh, which, which has become attached to uh, uh, cigarettes, is, uh, is already very, very standard. Um, we accept the idea of nicotine replacement therapy um, for, uh, as a way to help people to quit smoking, um, but the, the, the harm reduction concept, where people can use nicotine uh, replacement therapy to reduce how much they, they, they smoke is already a, a, a available. And, and NICE accepts this in the use of medicinal NRP. So for people who, um, who um, don't feel they can just quit completely, it enables them to cut down. Um, even though the, the, the health benefits of cutting down smoking are rather modest, because a lot of the health harms are sort of threshold effects and are not that dose related, it's easier to quit the less you smoke. So if, you, if, if you're only smoking five times a yes a day, it's easier than smoking 20 or 50 a day. Um, so if e-cigarettes delivered nicotine and nothing else, um, then there wouldn't really be any concern. There would just be another medicinal uh, device. But there, are, there, are, there is a concern about, about, about harm. Um, so what, what do we know about that? What, what can we, we actually say? People hear very conflicting messages about the, the safety or, or, or otherwise. Certainly Public Health England, Royal College of Physicians have come out with a, with a, a fairly clear uh, statement that the harms are in the bottom 5% of, 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 of smoking. But what, what is that based on? So this is quite, quite a nice study published this year looking at, uh, just cross-sectionally, at um, uh, the levels of carcinogenic materials in individuals who are either smokers or dual users of smoking and, and nicotine replacement therapy, dual users of uh, cigarettes and, or e-cigarettes and normal cigarettes, only on NRP or only on electronic cigarettes. So this, first of all, is just looking at the urinary nicotine levels. But you can see that, I, I mean, with some variation, uh, electronic cigarettes, dual use cigarettes only, are all delivering similar levels of nicotine to individuals who are using them, which suggests that they're effective in that sense. Um, I won't go through this table, but broadly speaking, you can see that the, well, you can't see that, the, 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 um, the, the smokers are, are here, uh, both smokers alone and, and dual, uh, dual users, and the levels of these various toxic materials are about the same in the smokers, whether they're also vapors or not, which is what you'd expect. And in people who are only vaping, the levels of these uh, toxic materials are the same in NRT and vaping. So from a, and from a, a, carcinog from a carcinogen point of view, in these individuals who are actually using and are established users, there certainly seems to be no difference between um, vaping and uh, standard nicotine replacement therapy. Um, and this is just one of the, the actual following levels 
basically the NRT here and the electronic cigarette here are, are lower than just the, just, just the um, smoking part. Um, certainly, if you, uh, if you, if you take, th there are biological effects to, to, to the vapor. Um, and uh, there are studies that show that, that there, may be, there may be producing some oxidative stress. Um, there's a paper recently in Thorax suggesting that the nicotine, that the nicotine containing flavors may be driving some of the processes that produce emphysema. Um, uh, these are single studies. A, a lot, lot, lot more research is needed. Everyone says more research is needed, but this really is is is, is, is the, the, the case. Certainly, a lot of the people researching emphysema have commented that it's extraordinarily difficult to produce emphysema in in, in mice like this. And if there was a model where you could just do it by putting nicotine in the lung, they'd have done it by now. So there's there's some skepticism about this, but you know I think the, 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 there's no reason to, to disbelieve this experiment. But it, you know, it needs to be reproduced, and, and its implications need to be to be, to be monitored as well. Um, the other issue around harms is is if you like unnecessary harm from vaping. As I said, there are thousands of different fluids that are available. Um, one of the concerns was that as people were inhaling all sorts of different flavorings, that there would be this great outbreak of hypersensitive pneumonitis. People would who a few individuals, but you know the, the, the sensitivity is rare. But if lots of people are being exposed, you would be getting uh, lots of episodes of people with a, with a sort of allergic type of reaction um, and, and uh, sort of pneumonia-like symptoms. That doesn't seem to be happening. But um, th there are clearly some chemicals which are which are more more hazardous than others. So this uh, what, what this uh, graph is showing is the is the res response of human lung cells, so human lung fibroblasts to various e-liquids or c uh, cigarette smoke extracts. Um, and the, the, the outcome is uh, production of, a, of an inflammatory marker. So if, the, if, 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 if inflammation is happening, you get a, a higher bar. So the, the, the air, the, the, the propylene glycol, the, the tobacco flavor, um, uh, you know, grape flavor, uh, it, it doesn't seem to be producing very much effect on these cells. The cigarette smoking extract uh, does produce big inflammatory response. Now, cinnamon flavor, for whatever reason, seems to be spectacularly popular. Now, you know, the takeaway message from this, if this is true and you've replicated and everything else, is that there will be some flavors that are really bad for you. Now, um, what we need to be able to do is to communicate that to people in a responsible way. So this doesn't, you know, this isn't something, wow, it turns out vaping is worse than smoking. It's that, it, that there may be some, some flavors which are very bad and we, we need rapid ways to assay flavors, to, to identify things that need to be taken off the market. Um, um, so, uh, yeah, the possibility that there is harm, some harm from the cigarette use is, 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 is there. Um, you know, if, if your glass is, is really, really, really half empty and it is, it is almost completely empty, you would say, well, this tobacco industry is going to kill a billion people in the 21st century. And you're saying that vaping is 5% of risk of those 50 million people. Um, so uh, I wouldn't recommend, five, five million or so, but I wouldn't recommend uh, approaching this from that point of view. But 5% is not nothing. But the point of it is that this isn't, this risk relative to smoking is extremely important for smokers. Um, and it's not challenged by the fact that somebody does a study that demonstrates in a lab that there is a harm from, from cigarettes. Of course, there, there will be biological effects. It's, it's the relative effect that's important. Um, now, why why getting this message right is important is that there's been a, 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 a very unfortunate shift in people's perceptions over the um, over the, the, the time that e-cigarettes have been becoming more used. So, um, this is public perceptions of, of the harmfulness of e-cigarettes, and you can see in 2013 only seven percent of people thought that vaping was was as or more harmful than smoking cigarettes, and that. That value has increased to 25%. So a quarter of the public think that vaping is as bad as smoking. Um, interestingly, as, as, as this number of people who, who believe quite erroneously that 25% is, that, that, it, that it's as, as, as uh, more, more equally harmful than smoking, the number of people that have, uh, don't know have come down. So the, the strength of conviction has increased as people's misapprehension has increased, which is, again, as I saw over last time. Um, so why is this? Well, because uh, because stories about things being bad are, are, are interesting. So you know, um, 
because the story that they can say from the smoke is quite boring, whereas uh, the, the, the media wants uh, one bites dog story. So these are uh, poisoning killers sore if they can have it spread across the state. Well, the, obviously, before they were e-cigarettes, how would people have known that it was poisoning? Um, Grand fighting for life after the resulting flames of e-cigarettes and night of their oxygen supply in hospital. Um, this isn't anything like as bad as it looks. Let me try and see if I can get a video for you. Maybe, maybe, maybe after. Um, so this, uh, she, she, she's fine. She runs, runs away completely un unharmed. But there's just, just behind her on the, uh, there's a, a, someone's put their uh, e-cigarette on top of an induction charging pad and the, uh, it's exploded. Um, you can just get the flash. Um, this sort of thing doesn't get widely reported. So this is what the London Fire Brigade has to say about e-cigarettes uh, in the three years since, uh, in the last three years, there are three and a half thousand smoking related fires with uh, 14 fires caused by e-cigarettes. Um, and remember, uh, you know, the, uh, thinking about the exposure, because we, we, we know in, in, in the UK there are now what, 2.8 million people using e-cigarettes. So it's not as many as there are smokers, maybe nine million smokers, but still that's, that doesn't explain the 14 to three and a half thousand ratio. So this is a really important story and people need to, to know about it, but you don't see this uh, as a sort of headline on the front page of the Daily Mail. So what about children? Um, they, 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 uh, there's been enormous progress in, uh, in, in reducing smoking rates among children. Um, so uh, you know, as a result, partly of the tobacco control plan introduced um, back in 98, um, the number of 11 to 15 year olds smoking at least one cigarette a week fell from 12 to 7 percent down to only 3 percent in 2014. So um, children are, 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 are given to smoking. So is there a, a risk that, some, that they could somehow expose them to the cards or re-expose them to, uh, to, to nicotine and reverse this, this improvement? Um, the much lamented Leonard Nimoy, who, who was for a while the most famous patient with COPD in the world, um, had, had this to say about it. Three samples have been given out at concerts. Get them hooked. Stay clean. Live long and prosper. Um, certainly in the UK, it really doesn't seem to be an, a, a, an issue. So survey data suggests that the um, vast majority of children haven't used e-cigarettes, don't really know what they are, or if they've tried them, they've tried them once or twice. And very few use them, you know, in the la only 1% are using them in the last month. Um, it, 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 this is not something that is taking off uh, in, in, in certainly in the UK, and almost everyone who is who's a, almost all children who are who are using e-cigarettes are also smoking. Um, so you can see that the, the, the grey bars are the current smokers. So I, th these are people who use an e-cigarette often more than once a week, uh, and they're all either current or ex-smokers, sometimes current or ex-smokers, you know, sometimes. So. People who are a few never smokers have tried them once, uh, and this this doesn't seem to be certainly so far something that is a, that is a real problem in the UK. I think partly because it's been possible to push these new pieces of legislation about how they're marketed and prohibit selling them to children, um, and there doesn't seem to be any evidence of a gateway effect. So these are this is for 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 all, uh, for all uh, among all the children who have tried e-cigarettes. Uh, this blue line is, is I tried using an e-cigarette before I first tried smoking a real cigarette, and that's about eight, ten percent. So that there isn't a, it, that it, this does not seem to be a gateway thing to smoking. Um, so uh, in, in terms of regulation, um, at the moment, uh, e-cigarettes have to be our consumer products. They have to be safe um, uh, in the sense they, you know, they, 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 they don't expire and that they don't deliver something that's known to be um, poison. Morally, um, a, a combination of the, the, the UK legislation, the EU Tobacco Products Directive, mean essentially that the there'll be two streams. So if you if you produce a high nicotine product, that will have to be mentioned as regulation, um, and the lower content, lower content, um, so below 20 milligrams per mil, which actually covers almost all uh, current products, um, will have to. Uh, there, there are limitations, so they have to commit to paying those extra charge to their basically. So they, they will be cheaper and easier for the manufacturers, but there will be this limitation on the amount you can make and claim about uh, this is something that will help you to stop smoking. Um, so 
one of the things about talking about e-cigarettes, which is a constant anxiety, is that it, 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 it takes up all the discussion, all the time, and we get away from the other things which we know work and need to be done about, about uh, smoking. So we need a tobacco control plan. The government's led it lax. It's 18 months since it, it, it went out. Um, we know that vaping is much safer than smoking. I think that's a, a reasonable statement, which is hard to contradict rationally. Um, I wouldn't say that for any individual smoking smoker that vaping is the preferred line I'd recommend because we know that nicotine replacement therapies and, and plans are effective and we know much more about their safety. But I, I think we should support vaping and I would not discourage people. It's important that smoking cessation services um, support people who choose to use vaping as a way to quit smoking. Uh, in general, uh, I think if people are you know, are established with vaping, it's probably in the long term sense that it's going to provide a good way of life as well. But if you don't, there may be some harm there that goes on for 40, 50 years. Um, vaping needs to be regulated in a way that, that is important to the, the safety issues. We want, we, want, we want vaping liquids to be as safe as possible. We don't want them flavoured with our nicotine. Toxic. We, we want the elements to be functioning properly and safely and not to be releasing anything uh, you know, metal particles. And they, so th there, are, there are technical issues. We want high quality devices. Um, we want to make sure that it's that they can be marketed to people that don't smoke cigarettes at all, um, and not to children, and to cool the paper. Um, we need to have a sensible approach to the tobacco industry. The tobacco industry is still the tobacco industry. It's not there aren't two tobacco industries. The this um, you know this is made by British American Tobacco, um, and uh, the. Um, because vaping exists, because e-cigarettes exist, I think the tobacco industry is about um, makes a profit from nicotine addiction and selling people a product to do with nicotine addiction. They are if, if e-cigarettes exist, they are going to make them. Um, it's not necessary to be deluded by the industry or, or for one second to believe that they have any serious interest in harm reduction. To acknowledge the fact that you know, vaping exists, it will have the effects it has to have over you know, some people that are buying it. But it's important not to sneak in to the, uh, back to the public health table. Um, maybe something to discuss afterwards. The, the, one of the issues was around the, uh, uh, defendant pleading your air and whether people should be allowed to vape in places that are smoke free. Um, I think this is a, you know, is a, is a, is a, a controversial area. I think in general, it's, uh, you know, vaping is not smoking, so it, it isn't automatically covered by the ban. I think that if you, um, that there are a lot of complicated psychological processes about how areas work um, and in general I think it's just worth me going back to say they probably should be vape as well but n not in the uh, you know the idea of having a vaping room I think is ostensibly a way of you know that most smoking rooms are not set up for those who can and for those who smoke they're each slightly different there's some people can see that there's something to talk about and discuss them afterwards so thank you Someone get this up for me. I don't think I know how to do it. Um, so we, we live in a, an era of uh, disruptive technologies. Um, I've chosen to give my talk a somewhat provocative title. Could novel nicotine delivery devices make cigarettes obsolete? So is the uh, tobacco market about to become one of those markets which uh, is getting a complete makeover. We've seen it in many industries um, in the past few years. So the main question I'm going to be looking at, and some of it will be a, a, a bit related to what Nick's been talking about, but, but I'm more going to be focusing on the question of, well, are novel nicotine delivery products good enough as nicotine delivery devices to satisfy consumers? So the, less on the, uh, the health side, more on how they work as nicotine delivery devices. And I want to start by just going back to having a think about, well, what is the cigarette? I 
And I think it was beautifully expressed back in the early 1970s by a chap called William Dunn, who worked for Philip Morris, and was known as the nicotine kid in Philip Morris, because he was a, a great advocate within the company of smoking of nicotine addiction. And what he said was, the cigarette should be conceived of not as a product, but as a packet. The product is nicotine. Think of the cigarette pack as a storage container for a day's supply of nicotine. Think of the cigarette as the dispenser for a dose unit of nicotine. Smoke is beyond question the most optimized vehicle of nicotine and the cigarette the most optimized dispenser of smoke. So the, cig the cigarette is a very successful device, way of delivering nicotine. But as you heard, um, as Mike Russell said, it, it, it gives you the nicotine, but it kills you through the uh, impurities in the uh, delivery uh, mechanism. So I'm going to be showing you a number of uh, uh, pictures which show the pharmacokinetics of nicotine as taken in from different devices. And this is the cigarette. So when you, when you smoke a cigarette over a period of about 10 minutes, you get a very rapid uptake of nicotine. If this is in the yellows in your venous blood, you go from about no nanograms per, li per mil of nicotine up to 20 or even more. And then it's distributed in the body and it's free for contact. And superimposed on that, you've got a series of arterial pulses of nicotine with each puff that you take. So you've got lung delivery of nicotine and very rapid uptake into the bloodstream. So this is the, if you like, the competition that other uh, nicotine delivery devices are up against. Really. The cigarette is the, the sort of crack version of delivery system. So what do cigarettes offer? Well, they give rapid lung delivery of nicotine. The, the user can control the, their dose puff by puff. The, the rapid increment in blood nicotine which is sufficient to give positive rewards for people to keep. People do like nicotine for sure. Uh, you can also use it to get negative rewards, that is to avoid the unpleasantness of uh, going below your preferred blood nicotine level and getting a withdrawal. And what we know about uh, cigarettes is that it's, it's not just the nicotine, it's also the combination of nicotine with sensory factors in which it uh, is very reinforced. So we've got three potential categories of harm reduction products. First one I'll say something about is Swedish oral snuff, uh, which is a, an oral nicotine product, but as you'll see, it's very popular in Sweden. Then I'll say a little bit about the current generation of nicotine replacement products. And then I'll talk about novel, non-combustible aerosol nicotine delivery. So that includes uh, e-cigarettes, but it's not limited to e-cigarettes. So snus is, uh, it's, it's a little, it used to be loosely packaged, a sort of wad of nicotine that you stuck between lip and gum. It tends to be packaged in little tea bags these days, but you still pass it between lip and gum. And it's, it's a fairly good way of getting nicotine into people. Uh, uh, over, you can see that over a period of about 15 minutes, you can uh, you can get up to 10, 12 nanograms per mil of nicotine. You don't have the, the very rapid absorption, no lung absorption. The, the absorption is through the lining of the oral uh, mucosa. But it is sufficient for this to be a very popular nicotine product in Sweden. And in fact, it, it dominates the market for tobacco in Sweden. So here's some uh, data on male tobacco prevalence uh, over, for, 
over, over the, the last 10, 15 years. So overall daily tobacco use uh, starts quite high, over 30%. In 2016, the most recent data we've got down to about 26%. That what's interesting about this is, is you break it down into well, what product is contributing. Well, cigarette smoking is now in adult Swedish males down to 8%, which is just about the lowest in the world. Cigarettes are no longer a really important uh, product. Swedish market and snooze uh, it started at about 22% it's down now to 18% so snooze seems to now the dominant uh, tobacco product uh, on the Swedish market and if we look at uh, death rates from uh, tobacco use Swedish men stand out as having a much lower with any other country in the European Union and one of the lowest uh, in the world continent. So there are health implications. Now the, the interesting thing about uh, snooze and cigarettes and, uh, and indeed nasal swab users in, 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 in this country is that if you, if you look at blood nicotine levels on a normal day of use just after people have taken their preferred type of product and used it in the very, very first usage, we see a remarkable consistency in the uh, blood nicotine levels which which we measure. And what, what this seems to imply is that the controlling factor in the use of all of these different products, whether it's a cigarette, nasal smoke, or oral smoke, the, what smokers are looking at, or users are looking at, is the ability to regulate their nicotine levels with their preferred uh, level. And you can do that both from oral snuff, nasal snuff, and from cigarette smoking. So what, what does the Swedish experience with snooze tell us? Well, I think the really important is that it gives proof of principle that non-combustible forms of nicotine can be accepted to consumers and can win out over cigarettes as public tobacco. Of course, it doesn't show that snooze is the right product for all Americans. So NRT, um, if we look at uh, the, the pharmacokinetics various products available. Here's our cigarette. Here we have the patch, the most boring way of talking it's been ever devised. It takes many hours to get not much nicotine into the system. Nicotine gum, inhalator, lozenge, pretty slow absorption. Uh, you don't get very much. The nasal spray comes closest, uh, but deficiencies in terms of uh, nasty nasal side effects and is not necessarily um, swept the board. So what do, what do NRT products offer? Well, they, they, they offer something for the trough maintainer. That is the person who's trying to avoid the unpleasantness of nicotine um, absorption. So they, they do reduce the absorption, but they don't offer much in the way of positive rewards. They're not giving any feedback to the system, which probably explains why uh, NRT products haven't had uh, any impact on non-tobacco users. They haven't appeared to the market for um, new consumers. Now, in, in 2009, I, I gave a talk to a, a nice, um, what do you call it, a citizen council, where they, they were looking at the issue of talk about uh, new products. And at that, at that time, um, e-cigarettes were very much the new kid on the block. 
so they, they, they've, they've really hardly hit the market. And the only products which were available at that time were the so-called cigarette uh, pipes that uh, Nick showed. And, and this was, was my conclusion at, at, at that time, that they're not the answer. And I noted that it was a, really a formidable technical challenge to achieve completely acceptable lung deliveries. But if, if it could be achieved, it could surpass the lung. So that was um, eight years ago. Um, Tentatively put forward a, 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 a specification of what, what do you actually need to, to succeed in, in a successful new generation of lung products. Uh, and based on the experience of this group, I think you've know, got to be able to make lung cancer surgery at least 10 million dollars or more in 10 years. No adverse adverse side effects. It's got to have sensory properties behavioral rituals to be the basis for conditioning association. And it has to give the user the ability to regulate their blood sugar from their body. So the last few years has seen a, a, a really uh, vigorous evolution in the products available. And I'm just going to uh, come to uh, three different show you data which is quite recent and, and of them. First of all, nicotine uptakes from electronic cigarettes. Well, there's been great strides in the design and manufacture of these devices. We've had so-called second generation uh, e-cigarette devices which uses a tank system and then third generation ones which tanks and mods are in for no man's land. One of the main new features seems to be more powerful batteries, which uh, can achieve more effective nicotine delivery. And this is a study by Wagner and a colleague, which is in battle control earlier this year, looking at absorption from second and third generation uh, e-cigarettes in, in people who were using these kinds of devices. So they first of all looked at absorption over a, a, a 10 minute period when uh, they were just puffing according to fixed regime. And then they were asked to use their devices ad lib for another hour. And the, the third generation product, as you can see, uh, is, is giving cigarette pipe uh, absorption period of five minutes. You're going from essentially nothing up to about 15 nanograms per mil in just a short period. The second generation uh, is not giving such rapid, it's still rapid absorption, but not getting to such high levels. But then people using that ad lib get up to the same blood levels as the people using the third generation. So this is radically different from the earlier generation e-cigarette devices. It, these seem to have cracked the code when it comes to um, presenting nicotine to people in a way in which they can get <coughs> lung delivery. Now, the, the second category of product I want to talk about is one that we haven't heard about yet, but this is one which the tobacco industry is now um, pushing very strongly. And th what they call them is, is heat not dead devices. They're, 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 they're sort of like uh, e-cigarettes. You, you have a, a, an electric heating device which heats tobacco to about 300 degrees centigrade, so it's not to the point of combustion, but it's sufficiently hot to liberate nicotine uh, from the device. And 
PMI have got a, uh, a device they call IPOS, which has now been on the market in Japan. So that's the thing now. And it's been, been launched in about 20 countries. And so it is also now available in the UK. Um, here are the uh, published data on the pharmacokinetics of uh, sheet net burn. So here's a cigarette, here's the heat net burn device, and it's shown very similar absorption over a, a, the same sort of period of smoking cigarette. So again, it's, it's clearly uh, producing lung delivery of nicotine in a very highly analogous to cigarettes. Now the, the PMI claim that the toxins uh, which are in cigarette smoke are reduced by at least 90% uh, in the aerosol uh, produced from these devices. Uh, but, of course, that's their data. But I think they've done some quite good science, I have to say, uh, but there's no... Uh, you know, we, this is a very new area and there, there really isn't much independent The, the final device is, is one which, again, another uh, a PMI device. Uh, it's what they currently call platform C because it hasn't actually hit the market <coughs> yet. Um, what it consists of is um, a, a device, again, which, which uses the same heating platform as the uh, heat net burn, but it only needs contains nicotine and, and, and a liquid, and it contains lactic acid. They're heated to about <coughs> 100 degrees centigrade, so even to a lower temperature than heat net burn. And then that creates an aerosol. And uh, as you can see again, the, this is just a little, uh, this is a magnification of this. that it's giving uh, very rapid absorption over a, a period of about five or six years. So again, it, it's looking as though they've cracked the problem of lung delivery. So there are many unanswered questions, but what it does look like is that the, that the technical problem of getting lung delivery of Nick already showed uh, data from this. This is the uh, Shahab study. And uh, that's the only study at the moment which has looked at the issue of how, how much our toxin is actually reduced between um, users of these products. So he showed uh, that, that they're, they're, they're much reduced type of times for the cigarette. Um, but uh, actually, there's also data now that you can, from another study, where you can compare the levels of the volatile organic compounds in vapors and in non vapors, and really there's no difference in the, between the levels in vapors and those in non vapors. So it does genuinely seem that these products are, are, are much reducing um, exposure. And like so, my final slide, are we coming to a tipping point? Well, I'm beginning to believe that we might be, that, that the technology has now developed to a point where uh, they do seem to be able to offer products which are viable in the marketplace. Philip Morris International have actually gone uh, public on their desire to move towards a non-combustible world. They, they are now leading the, the cheers for non-combustible products against the cigarettes. So, you know, we can 
been appropriately sceptical of that power, but it, it, it has seemed to indicate something serious is changing. Their, their heat not burn product has already achieved a, a market share in Japan of over 7%. And that was in January of this year. Constraints on the expansion is that they've actually run out of product resources, so producing enough of these things to supply the market demand. And, um, and finally, the, uh, the stock market is, is now assigning a value of $50 billion to the um, reduced risk product segment of the economy. So the stock market. So I think we get, there are many unanswered questions. We haven't really discussed a lot about the, the, the regulatory issues. Uh, and we don't know for sure what will happen health-wise. But I think there, there's some really interesting developments which could be going to change things in big ways. So thank you. different uh, compound. So thanks for asking me to um, at least share some of um, what I think are the data about cannabis, um, which clearly has a less um, kind of comprehensive research base than um, tobacco. So this is the kind of hemp plant cannabis catheter, and you all are aware the psychoactive compound is THC or tetrahydrocannabinol. And this list, by the way, is extremely short. If you go on to all the websites you choose to get into, the list goes much more than this, and I'm so behind with this nomenclature that I'm sure it's already out of date. So I'll ask some young people out there. <laughs> right, so um, as you know, you can take cannabis in several shapes and forms, and um, hashish or resin comes from the UK, herbal cannabis, marijuana, cannabis oil, um, and that's just pictures of what they look like you could try to go and buy some and preparation can say kind of uh, vary so I won't dwell on that but just let's try and get some of the data um, there's some innovative smoking method here not as refined as uh, e-cigarettes these are quite old pictures anyone recognize the drink um, commonest form in the UK is probably just in fact mixing it with tobacco and rolling your own joint so we have a major problem with trying to understand cannabis. The major problem is that most of the studies are self-reporting studies, number one. Number two is there's a changing potency of THC within your joint. Three is the delivery methods are now also mutating as we speak, and we've talked about vaporizers before, and even in cannabis, you can go onto Amazon and buy yourself a cannabis vaporizer. Um, smoking methods are quite different to the traditional tobacco cigarettes, they're normally without a filter, shorter butt length, and people smoke this at a much higher temperature. Your breath hold is also significantly different, which may account for some of the kind of barrel trauma that we see with it. And then add on top of that, you have to understand the differences in taking this, which country you take it in, then there's concurrent tobacco use. Some people mix it with it, and most cannabis pure smokers at the joint will also smoke tobacco. And uh, I'll show you some differences regionally, which is New Zealand, the, the Maori smoke it exclusively, but you know, one of the few, certainly in Western Europe, it's normally people smoke both. So methodolo method methodology wise, it's a bit of a problem. Um, certainly cannabis is the most commonly smoked illicit drug um, and here are the statistics. So what's interesting is in fact with time, we've seen a significant drop compared to 10 years ago. So there's some very nice reports that are out there you can access, and you'll see cannabis is top of the pack in terms of um, drug use, males more than females. 
this is the graph showing, in fact, over time, it seems to be reducing rather than increasing in terms of leaks. Where are we in the league table in terms of Europe? Well, you can see here we're kind of nearly in the kind of top four of the Premier League. So more like Arsenal <laughs> at the moment. Um, so 15-year-old youths, um, again, you know, lots to get offered. Percentage of crime, other drugs, again, less proportionally. And about 40% still have used it in the last month. So if that's a measure of chronic use, then we know that the percentage is about there. Okay, so ethnic differences. You may not be surprised by this or may be surprised by it. And then there's also the regional difference. So I was kind of slightly surprised by Slough, but maybe anyone living here in, in Slough can tell me what that is. Just a nugget. Your territory? Nope. Okay. Globally, um, and obviously this is a global health discussion, significant percentage do use or have used marijuana. And uh, the States probably got some data on it, as well as the US data. And again, that, that proportion is quite similar to what you would see in the UK. So THC is the kind of psych psychoactive compound and obviously no nicotine this time it's THC so we have to get our heads around this and um, it gives you a high as well as all these other um, phenomena now I'm purely concentrating on lung and almost arguably the non-lung repercussions are more important but let's let's stick to the lung for today's discussion so you remember what I was talking about in terms of potency well what's happened over time since the 40 years of data and the THC component in cannabis has increased. And some of you know of the kind of ultra potent types, which are um, skunk, for instance, but also now the semi synthetic kind of cannabinoids, which we're not going to talk about. We're talking here traditional cannabis, okay? But with time, the potency has gone up. So we need to have a little think about how we analyze that in the context of epidemiological studies. So what is the issue with cannabis? Well, th the problem is if you do smoke cannabis alone, let alone mixing it with tobacco, basically you're smoking all the kind of bad things in life in terms of carcinogens as well as things that irritate your airway. I've talked a little bit already about the fact that your breath hold technique is different and therefore arguably you're getting more of these compounds into your lungs, holding them for longer. What does that mean in reality? Um, well, one possibility is it's causing barotrauma. So these papers are relatively old, and there are several case reports in the literature about this. If you take out alpha-1 antitrypsin, these are young patients with parasitical lung disease, and these are some um, kind of exemplar. Now, I, I see this a lot, but actually I, I see this a lot with heroin smokers as well. So it's about barotrauma. It's about breath holding to get that hit into your um, central nervous system. Here's another case study. Um, this is another illustrating pneumothorax, millimeter sound, pneumopericardium. So if you inhale long enough, and as I say, cannabis isn't the only thing that does this. If you smoke anything, cocaine, heroin, hold your breath hard enough, you'll uh, rupture, get into the pleural cavity. This is one of my patients. They're 22, and they have CT scan. This is a normal lung. That's their CT. Now, I don't know how many 22-year-olds or 18-year-olds you scan, but just to see this level of parasitical emphysema is quite impressive to me. 30-year-old cannabis smoker, again, showing you these kind of tropical drillies. And this is an 18-year-old, so which again, not really what I expect to see when I scan an 18-year-old when I'm trying to rule out idiopathic or iatrogenic causes of pneumothorax. So this kind of stirred up some interest with me. Um, sorry, more cases, <laughs> more cases, more cases. <coughs> Pathologically, um, there's emphysema on the right, and then you have bong lung, which is obviously cannabis lung. If you care to look at bong lung a bit deeper, you'll see these kind of foreign body inclusions. And if you bronchoscope somewhere with a kind of chronic joint problem, you'll actually see lovely particulate draft material come out of the scope. Okay, so it's very difficult to ingest by your macrophages here now. 
So the kind of thing that's probably best described is chronic bronchitis in this setting. So you've got inflammation, atopia, metaplasia, dysplasia. So what, what, what do we have out there? That some of these studies are quite old. People started taking an interest in this some time ago. And I'm going to show you some historic studies. I'm going to show you some more studies from the last decade and then a kind of table looking at all the studies that we can or certainly try to look at. So you'll hear, see that the odds ratio of developing what are kind of pretty chronic bronchitic type symptoms, cough, sputum, and wheeze. So that odds ratio is up and these are significant amount of patients. There was some reduction in lung function, but now take all the lung fun function data and hold it in your head because every slide I show you will show you something slightly different. Okay, which is what I'm alluding to when I say when we talk about methodology of studying what happens with this, it's difficult. So here you go, another um, kind of now, this is in 2000, it's a big study from Taylor. And you see again, the symptoms come through, okay? So there's something about cough, wheeze, sputum. And then for some reason, Dr. Taylor decided to look at an FEV1, FEC ratio of 80% as his cutoff rather than the traditional um, COPD values. And again, there seemed to be a proportion that were certainly less in terms of that ratio. So this is a more recent paper in the ERJ by Hancock, and you'll see again, similar. I mean, you've got wheeze, you've got um, sputum cough. Breathlessness, not so much of a big problem. What's interesting about this study is they also study people who immediately, who, who start, stopped basically, and we did their prevalence of symptoms, and you see pretty quickly, you get a reversal of these chronic bronchitic type symptoms. So whatever the component is, at least in part, it's reversible. As I said, the lung function data, you just have to kind of read all the papers, but I'll show you a kind of snapshot across these. TLCO down, cannabis plus tobacco versus tobacco here is confounding fact, how do you get around that? Taylor again. Um, FEV1, FEC ratio, and interesting, Tashkin, who has written a lot on this in, in the US, actually doesn't really show very much lung function change at all. So here's one from um, Thorax in 2007. Now, you see I've kind of bolded up the countries. It's quite important that you kind of realize where these studies are being done. This is New Zealand. Again, HR, CT scan, so cross-sectional imaging, lung function questionnaires, and again, they show the dose response relationship, not only for FEV1 to FEC, but airway conductance, and interestingly show the increase in total lung capacity. This theme comes up again and again, and they estimated what a joint was in terms of tobacco equivalent. So interestingly, they didn't show much more emphysema in these smokers who just had cannabis alone, but what they did show was the decreased lung density. And as you know, we, we can have computerized methods of doing this. Now, what that's trying to tell you is, is there some element by which cannabis smoking is causing hyperinflation, okay, is the kind of hypothesis there. And as I said, their total lung capacity did seem to in increase. Here's another, this Hancock's paper I showed you. Again, when they looked at lung function, this is New Zealand again, you see there was um, an increase in FVC and total lung capacity, residual volume and airway resistance. So physiologically, you're not getting standard airway obstruction as in COPD land. You're getting, for some reason, increased lung capacity. Now, whether that is airway conductance and resistance is the question. Here we go again. Uh, this is a study from the US, big study, um, and you'll see lung function longitudinal data, so quite strong. And what they showed was a nonlinear relationship to cannabis smoking. So here are my light smokers. And what, what do you notice there? In fact, your lung function improves. Okay, your FEV1, your, your airway caliber appears to in fact improve. And even if you're a very heavy marijuana smoker, there's no obvious significant deterioration in your spirometric function. Now, we can talk about this in a while. Is spirometry the best measure of lung damage? Okay, in any case, if you're using it occasionally, you're not taking very much of it, which 
arguably maybe the pattern that's here in the UK, for instance, because they're just using it when they're going out, then it's unlikely to cause, at least on traditional criteria, any lung damage. Now, I've shown you this, and again, if you have the time to look at these, you will see there's a very mixed bag of lung function that comes out. And again, I'll go back to this statement, which is I think the problem is the heterogeneity in terms of the cannabis itself, how you smoke it, how much or how much grass have you put in your cigarette? Well, you can't control it. Yeah, so there are lots of things that are moving around that may not allow us to be very um, clear about what the airway effects are. It's a very good review by Ribeiro and Philippine, who you should have probably asked them to give this talk. They were hammered here, um, and basically lots of heterogeneity. Right, so what do we do when we kind of look down the airway? Well, actually, yeah, you've got lots of changes. I alluded to this earlier. You will see changes of metaplasia. Um, if you actually inspect your bronchus, again, there's swelling, there's edema. And this is two to three joints versus 20 to 30 cigarettes a day. Okay, what looks macroscopic down your scope looks the same. If you look at things like neutrophil counts, IL-8, again, they go up. I'll shoot through these, but basically there's also some additional um, immunology that may mean it's less, um, it, it causes less immunity in terms of your airway and ability to fight and kill bacteria, as also in illustrated by this paper by Bolden. Now I'm going to come back to those papers in a minute. So in summary, chronic bronchitis, I think there appears to be a relatively good story emerging, which is that of the um, symptoms of chronic bronchitis. There appear to s be some element of hyperinflation, an airway resistance, and you can show inflammatory change if you biopsy these people. Okay, so just take care of this alone. Okay, what about malignancy? Another kind of topic which is related to lung disease. Here is my patient, 38. Again, no control studies, <laughs> but this guy had a meth and he was a heavy cannabis smoker. As per tobacco, there are plenty of reasons to suppose the other thousands of compounds you're smoking, as opposed to just the psychoactive compounds, may be carcinogenic, and lots of uh, molecular and cellular mechanisms by which that may occur, including THC itself. So what, what's the data out there? Well, it's kind of mixed. <laughs> So the US data don't appear to show any significant respiratory malignancy excess risk. Okay, now what's different from the US versus another country? Well, we're going to show you. So this is Sweden, um, which I presume they, they prefer snuff rather than um, <coughs> smoking anything, but for what it's worth. So again, that's very good. By the way, you want to do really good phenotypic studies, choose the military each time, military or doctors. That's the group you want to follow. You, they never lose, you never lose sight of them. Follow them up. Anyway, in terms of the Swedish data, there is some evidence of a risk of lung cancer over a 40-year period. So pretty good follow-up period. And uh, here is New Zealand. And the reason <coughs> New Zealand's the ideal country to study is because it has one of the highest rates of lung cancer. Number two, there is a high use of just joints in that area. They don't smoke tobacco over there. And the Maoris in particular um, have this. So if you look at the literature of cannabis, guess more than half of the literature will be from New Zealand. So Taylor, Hancock, Ebelington. And what they showed was here um, an excess risk from cannabis smoking in there. Okay, so varying data, as I said, difficult. Here is a meta-analysis, however, by Zhang which shows the only study that went over was the New Zealand study, <laughs> okay, which I've just shown you. So the US studies have not shown an excess risk. So again, I'll leave that with you, except to say that we're slightly confused here. Infection, lots of case reports, aspergillus, fungal infections, my favorite bug, TB, cluster around water pipes. You can do shisha pipes, by the way. Necrotizing granuloma, again, is this all fungal contamination? Fungal contamination again. What's interesting is THC has a bronchodilator effect, okay? So here we go, a couple of papers, again from Tashkin, who I said as before, has published a lot on this from New England. Actually, 
is that if you could drop it down into it, as does this paper can, and then you can chart it on some asthmatic. Now, some people got worse, by the way, so I don't recommend you go out there and use it as your asthma pump. In addition, it does have some anti-inflammatory properties. THC itself has some anti-inflammatory properties in the same way that it stops you killing bacteria. You could argue maybe stopping you get inflammation within your airway. Again, jury's out there. So in summary, <laughs> I think the confounding factors make it very difficult for us at this point to be didactic or, or clear about the outcome in terms of lung. I think the chronic bronchitis story, it seems to me all the data show you, you certainly can get the symptoms of chronic bronchitis. It appears to be reversible. It is different to tobacco in terms of the spirometric uh, criteria. That, and this may be confounded by the bronchodilator as well as the anti-inflammatory effects, we don't know. But it certainly seems to be a recurrent theme of higher FVC occurring. There is some association with lung cancer, I think it's unclear, and lots of case reports. And really, that's where we are right now, I'm afraid. No clearer. Thank you for listening. while you're thinking about that, um, going back to your question, I suspect all those figures have been adjusted for past years, so uh, that's why the scale didn't tell you um, how much it was compared to what you think. Well, a lot of people have suggested that you know, e-cigarettes are for the sophisticated Western market, but they're not going to, they're going to ca carry on pushing cigarettes in the less developed world. I'm not sure that that's the case. Um, BAT is very, very big in um, countries like uh, Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, um, Asia, not such advanced economies, but they are also going in a big way into uh, these kinds of products now. And stuff I've seen suggests that from purely from a profit-making point of view, uh, th the, the economics of these things are comparable with cigarettes. So that th th they're looking at um, profit margins which are comparable to what they can achieve from cigarettes, so they're quite happy to envisage market shifting. I mean, it does seem to me to be an extremely dangerous thing to do, to just put in random flavourings and hope that they're not going to be toxic when vaporised. Um, I mean, we've had lots of, well, several examples of cases where inadvertently a um, large number of the population had very serious lung damage from inhaling things that were thought to be good for them. Um, is, there, is there any move to, to regulate that? Um, I, I mean, I think the, 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 I was expecting that there would be lots of cases of pneumonitis and that would be, you know, we'd be having to say, well, you know, 
uh, if everything is affecting a few people and if it, if it happens to them, then they can stop voting. Um, but it really doesn't seem to have been a, a, a problem. So far. No, we, we know that um, we know that these cigarettes are interesting. So I, I think you can be really confident that if anyone in the world has a good case of lung disease caused by voting, they will publish it um, because it's you know, the world is crying out for these kind of stories. Um, so I, I think there is some genuine reassurance about that, the rest of the immunology speaking. But the the, 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 the sort of possible, say, increased risk associated with something like the, you know, the cinnamon flavor, maybe the skew or cherry flavor, is, is going to come out over a very long period of time. Um, and may be very difficult to pick up as a signal in someone that smokes for 20 or 30 years. And then rather than quitting, they then switch to a way of vaping, which turns out to be a flavor that isn't, isn't as, as safe. Um, but it, 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 if, there w if there was a, a way to produce a, and I, I imagine that we will get to this point at some point in, in, in coming years, a, a way of, of a kind of panel of tests, which enables you to identify particular flavors and things as safe as everything else, and, and, and one or two things as being more, more dangerous, that would be helpful. Um, and I, I think the, the move towards a better product will help to reduce some of the, the completely unnecessary risk. So you know, some of the cheaper devices, the, the, the heating elements will kind of decay so that, that they, they start to emit you know, metal particles and things like that, which is, is unnecessary. There's no reason why, why you know, devices should. Well, the, 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 the question is going to be whether wh what happens to these particularly child smoking rates. Because people don't start smoking at, at, at above 20 years very much. So the, 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 the signal of alarm is going to be if those rates stop going down. Um, and the difficulty, I suppose, for the hypothesis that that is caused by these cig e cigarettes is, is that there is there is a constant temptation for governments to stop doing the things that um, that we know have been successful in driving those rates down or, or already. So um, one, one of the concerns about e-cigarettes is that they help people to think that this problem of smoking has been solved, that we have a solution. Um, and you know, I accept, if, as far as the industry is concerned, they don't care how people get their nicotine as long as they can sell it to them and that their market is sustained. So they're, they're, they're obviously not interested in quitting. They want people to, to stick across. Um, 
show, uh, you know, as a backer um, control, uh, you know, as, 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 as smoking cessation services are being cut across this country at the moment, one of the rationales that accounts for giving for it is that it's okay, everyone's safe in there, so we don't, we don't need to offer people smoking cessation support, they can just go down the high street and buy, a, buy a, an e-cigarette. Um, so that, you know, at, at, a, at a public health level, the question is, You've got someone who's smoking now. They're, 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 the, 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 the identity which we want for them is to be an ex-smoker, so someone who, 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 who quits and that they're not consuming anything at all. Now, a portion of those smokers will just carry on smoking whatever you do. Some of them will, will quit, and how many of them quit completely will depend on um, you know, a whole series of factors, including the provision of like conventional smoking cessation support, and then a, a, another proportion of people are going to going to be vaping and may continue vaping for a very long time. So there is something about weighing up the, 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 the small harm over a long period of time of, of switching to being a vapor for a long period of time versus um, quitting completely. And I suppose the other thing is people who smoke a bit, uh, which is still extremely bad for you, and are mostly mostly vaping, so they, they, they don't become completely an ex-smoker, I'm afraid. Um, so, I, I, I mean, it's difficult to know how to, how to come up with a, a way to test all those competing uh, hypotheses, but it, it's, um, we, we just need to watch very closely. And as I said, it, it's important not to trust the industry. I mean, it, it's amoral, as well as, well, no, it's not amoral is the wrong word. It, it, that they're interested in what they can do to make a profit. There's clearly money in alternative non-smoking devices. Um, and they're very happy to take advantage of the market. Um, but you know, when you hear the chief executive Philip Morris saying that you know they want to get out of smoking, well, maybe they should not take Uruguay to court for you know introducing the sort of things that help people to stop smoking and so on and so on. So I, I, it's important not to, to be naive and pretend that there are two different industries. I have thought that th 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 there are probably two key population things to, to monitor. One is the prevalence of combustible tobacco smoke. And that, that tells us all about is it one of the reasons gas smoking is as bad. And the second is the, the prevalence of nicotine smoking. So we, we look at both. So if you looking at those two together. Americans have been obsessed with the idea of e-cigarettes as a gateway to cigarette smoking for adolescents. But that, that obsession currently flies in the face of all the available data that shows cigarette preference reducing at uh, historically uh, unparalleled. So unless there is some uh, some new wave coming, which of, of which there's no sign at the moment, of uh, shifting nicotine use over from tobacco smoking to tobacco smoking, then these things are, are, are <coughs> looking positive. I think people will vape to, to attempt to achieve the same level of nicotine, so that they, they titrate <coughs> their vaping to achieve a similar, a similar um, nicotine dose. Are they retarded? Um, I don't know. No, I'd say, I'd say not. I mean, typically nicotine users are not aware of how they are, the way they use products 
varies in order to make causation. I mean, the, the classic example of that is looking at nicotine intake in people who smoke what, what used to be called uh, low-carb, ultra-low carb cigarettes, and that's the short-cut, ultra-low form versus smokers who are smoking Benson and Hedges or King Size, you know, which are normally in the delivering 10 or 20 times as much nicotine as carb. And when you looked at a population like that, people who were smoking those very different brands were getting the same nicotine intake. So they were simply modifying the way they puffed and inhaled to uh, achieve a higher nicotine exposure from what was ostensibly a relatively good product. And people really were not aware they were doing that, which is why the industry was able to get away with the, the con for so long that you know, low tar was uh, a desirable thing. If the, if, the, if the mother is yeah, vaping. I think the, the, the evidence on the on passive exposure to e-cigarette um, emission products so far suggests that there's very little uh, exposure to bicarbonate. So, so it's really not a health problem in the same way as exposure to cigarette smoke is. But of course, you know, it's, it's become a, a very live issue as population warms, the perception is that the environment should be completely smoke free, then you know, many in many cases people are going to be an absence of vaping as well as an absence of cigarette smoke. But I, I think the argument for that is not really based on, on health. It's not I think there isn't very much long, th there's not very much data so far. I mean, there's, there's certainly have, have been, uh, th there's, there's certainly work suggesting um, short term effects on uh, vascular tone uh, associated with, with, with vaping, which I suppose you'd expect with the excess of nicotine. Um, I mean, again, the, 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 the substances in the tar which are causing the vascular malady are, are not there in, in, in vaping. So there is again the assumption that the, the risk is, is lower. Um, it's, it's partly a, uh, a respiratory bias, I suppose. Um, one, is, I mean, one, one of the other related paradoxes, of course, is that respiratory people are tremendously interested in air quality, but of course the diseases that air quality kills people to are mostly cardiovascular and cerebrovascular <laughs> diseases. There, there is a very substantial epidemiology on the uh, effects of Swedish snus on uh, cardiovascular uh, system. And there, in general, uh, there appears to be no overall increase in risk of cardiovascular disease uh, attributed to snus. Although there is some evidence that if people get, have a, have a The evidence on that is a bit equivocal, but, but overall, it, the, the, the suggestion is that there, that there is no strong evidence that 
significantly in the way that sluice delivers things and produce much carbon emissions for business. Now, that leaves open the question of, of whether with, with, with lung delivery you might, you might see other effects. I mean, it's, certain, it's clearly the case that people are, are vaping things that are not you know, legal. Um, and, you know, there may well be harms associated with that because of the, because the, 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 way that, the way that people titrate their input may be different to what they're accustomed to. So, um, you know, as a, as, a, as a person with an em interest in emphysema, my initial response to anyone who, who, who smokes with cannabis is, well, why didn't you just consume it orally? Because that would must be much safer, um, and that that makes people that know about psychiatry very unhappy, because that's a really that's in fact it turns out to be a really bad idea. So you know you you you, you learn, and it's good to sort of cross cross pollinate these ideas. So that's not good advice, and I I, I you know there is that that's that's clearly an element of of, of of the potential harm to and potential to a different group of of of, of people. So you know our, our focus is mostly around current smokers and and the potential that vaping has for them. Um, there is concern about children generally who, who becoming, you know, taking up vaping, which seems not to be borne out by the facts so far. Um, and I think there is, but there's another, another population, uh, an incarcerated population as well, where this is, you know, that th this use of, you know, existing and new psychoactive agents is, 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 is potentially a, a, a problem. But there are there are other interesting issues that are emerging, which uh, relate to sort of unintended regulatory harm. Uh, so clearly, we're in a world where these delivery systems are evolving very rapidly, and um, so you know, we had a tobacco product directive introduced just just last year, which specified strict rules about what e-cigarette devices had to look like. So, so among other things, they specified a maximum concentration of nicotine in, in liquids. And obviously people thought it would be a good thing. Uh, but it, it's, it, it's now becoming apparent that that, that, that that may give rise to problems because the, the device I, I showed you where the Nicotine is mixed with uh, lactic acid to make an oil substance, which hadn't hit the market. Now, in that in that product, the nicotine is present as almost pure nicotine, so it's very high in concentration, which means that it cannot be uh, marketed under uh, as a uh, an e-cigarette. At the same time, uh, it doesn't have any tobacco in it, so it can't be, um, it, it isn't a tobacco product, so they can't say, well, you know, we'll just market it as a tobacco product. So, you know, you, you can have weird situations arising where what looks like one of the least, but one of the sort of purest systems yet devised runs risk of running foul of all the various different routes to market as to regulations are devised. So <laughs> that's a real problem. Yeah, um, keeping in mind that cinnamon rolls is good. <laughs> 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 
<laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>